Okay, uh, so it looks like we're live. So I'm Alana Hernandez, I'm the Curatorial Fellow here at MCASD. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to our fifth and final charla of To Tame a Wild Tongue, Art After Chicanismo with David Avalos. So a, a quick little housekeeping thing to begin. Um, if there's anyone that has questions, please do utilize the Q&A function below, um, and then we'll try to get to those questions at the end. Um, but before I start anything, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that from my office here in Sherman Heights, San Diego, I'm on the traditional territory of the Kumeyaay. Yes, and um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Kumeyaay as well. It's a sovereign nation whose people have lived here for over 10,000 years. Their land encompasses territory north and south of the US-Mexico border and has never been ceded to either government. Thank you, David. Yeah, that was, it's super important to acknowledge where we are and, and the land that we're on currently and, and how it, we continue to exist in it. Um, so as I said, this is part of To Tame a Wild Tongue, Art After Chicanismo, which I can give a brief introduction there. But first, I think it's important that I read David's bio. Um, so David Avalos is a key figure in San Diego's Chicano art movement. Um, and he works in sculpture, installation, public projects, and his sculptures um, assert the vernacular of resquache, which I think we, we hopefully will get into to talk a little bit about what that means and give a nice definition there. Um, and so, yeah, so that, like I said, this is part of To Tame a Wild Tongue, Art After Chicanismo, the museum's first digital exhibition. And so you can see that here at mcasd.digital. And so the show uh, really looks at the 1980s to today. Um, and it, it uses the museum's collection for it. It's all, it's a collection based show. And it uses the like Chicano art movement of the 60s and 70s as a point of departure. And it looks at San Diego as this kind of point of, of importance, really taking into consideration um, the borderland region. So again, I'm thrilled to have David here with us. And as part of the exhibition, it has been split into five thematic sections, activism, resquache domesticana, labor, and the border. Um, so David's work is in two of the five sections. Um, and we can start here with this collaborative project um, from 1988. Um, and I know we won't spend too much time since we don't have Elizabeth or uh, Lewis here with us to also talk about this project. But um, as a key member of this collective of working collaborative with the two artists, it'd be great to kind of talk about this. Um, the title as it's written is Welcome to America's Finest Tourist Plantation. Um, so David, I, I wonder if you can say a little bit about this project and, and how it kind of came about and its relationship to the hubcaps as we've, we've kind of discussed. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding me of that conversation, that previous conversation. Um, this um, poster was timed to coincide with the Super Bowl. It was the first Super Bowl that was being um, sponsored by or hosted by San Diego. Uh, people were very excited about it. Uh, both uh, Elizabeth and Lewis were very familiar with the immigrant community, immigrant laborers here in San Diego as uh, well, uh, including authorized and unauthorized laborers. And uh, we decided together to do something to remind people that um, America's finest city was a plantation in the sense of labor that um, did not have civic representation uh, and labor that was, um, because of their undocumented status, labor that was very vulnerable to exploitation. Um, so this was something that was put on the back of buses. It was a public piece and it was intended to move around San Diego on the backs of these buses. So it went all the way through the county from the south uh, to the north and the east and the west and was intended to make its way into media. 
both electronic media and print media. There was a lot more pr print media back back in, in the day. Um, and it was a way, our way of reminding ourselves of how dependent San Diego, like cities across the whole country, how dependent San Diego was on immigrant labor. And you can't have a tourist event like the Super Bowl without uh, a tourist industry. And that tourist industry was primarily made up of uh, Mexican and Central American mm -hmm. uh, immigrant labor. Right, yeah, and I think what's so interesting about the show in general and, and this project and how it kind of fits into that is that you know this is kind of a raising consciousness of, of this invisible workforce, but certainly other artists in the show um, like Julio Cesar Morales, who we've talked about a lot, um, uh, highlights this kind of Im this hidden immigrant workforce and the importance of of really giving voice to to um, a lot of these issues. And I think this project really underscores that, which is which is nice. And again, um, it, you know, even it's it's interesting. This is from you know 1988. Again, conceived as part of the year of the Super Bowl, but it's continual issues, right? Of of um, invisible labor, but then certainly kind of the dark sides of, of immigration in that regard too, and how these informal economies continue to run our societies. Um, and so this is a really poignant, you know, cue to that. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to remind ourselves that during the COVID-19, many of the essential workers um, in the meatpacking plants, for example, the folks who um, work as service workers in hospitals and clinics um, are unauthorized and they have not been eligible for the kind of relief that was has been given to other workers uh, with the initial uh, uh, plan that was put forth by the federal government. Here in California, the governor has made some money available for unauthorized labor, but um, it hasn't been done across the country and it's an ongoing and ever present condition that um, we need to be reminded of day in, day, day in and day out. The uh, National Day Labor Organizing Network uh, has been very active in bringing forward uh, through street demonstrations as well as uh, informational campaigns to um, and, and assistance programs for the undocumented who aren't being provided money uh, to help them while they're performing essential services. Right, and I think, um, you know, as I said, this, is, this seems to be a continual issue and, and certainly made, made hyper visible during, during COVID. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for speaking on this. I know, um, I wish we had all three to really, all three of you to talk more about this project, but I think it was um, as conceived, the show was conceived originally as a, an in-person experience now virtually, um, but certainly this kind of fits into, like I said, all of these sections here that the show is trying to, to underscore. Yeah. But David, there was a really interesting story that you had told me in real, that how your hubcap series and um, specifically hubcap Milagro number no. six, the one that is in the museum's collection and how it relates to the bus posters. I know that um, uh, we had acquired this work in 1988, the same year that the bus posters were conceived. Um, and so, you know, we're thrilled to have this in the collection. And, and again, this is part of the Resquache section, which we'll kind of define later, but I think it's a nice segue into your hubcap work. Right, at one point, uh, so we had to pay rent for the uh, bus posters. And as a way of raising money, we, uh, I think through the personal relationship that Lewis Hawk had with uh, Hugh Davies, the director at the time, approached him and asking, asking for some financial support for the bus poster. He said he couldn't provide that, but he would be willing to purchase some of our artworks. Uh, and we could use the money as we chose. Uh, and so the hubcap Milagro number no. six that you're looking at right, that we're all looking at right now was one of the pieces Lewis and Liz um, sold 
a collaborative photo work that they did. And I sold the, the hubcap to the museum. So um, they're linked. The, the two pieces are very much linked. Uh, one enabled the other. It was a kind of um, bartering, if you will. Um, will, um, you know, it actually involved cash. It wasn't straight bartering in the technical sense, but it was it was an exchange that led to the our ability to get the resources, the financial resources to uh, do the bus poster. Mm -hmm. So it was Rasquache in that sense. <laughs> I guess, right. Yeah. There's different different levels of Rasquache. Um, I am glad that you brought up the word because it's something that you know I say often and it's a big part of this show. Um, Rasquache kind of defined by Ibarra Frausto uh, is this, this aesthetic, this um, kind of in your face aesthetic that has been cultivated by the Chicano uh, X community, um, Latinx community writ large about um, uh, this tenacity that this, uh, these communities have in terms of creating artwork or otherwise, um, often utilizing um, uh, found materials, uh, materials from car culture as we see here in this hubcap, um, but then also, uh, um, you know, material like tarps and things like that this and it speaks to this idea of, of utilizing um what you have what what is available to ones um in in creating work and so we've had a conversation about resquache and, and how um you know the impetus of this series is is kind of part of that and it can be um part of that but certainly your own upbringing with your father right as this uh, wharfs man that worked on wharf so i wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that Yes, uh, I can um, talk about that now, or I can talk about it with the um, next hubcap we're going to look at. Not that I'm suggesting we go to the next hubcap. I just wanted to say something about the Rasquache approach, and this in relationship to uh, Julio Cesar Morales's informal economy exploited, exploded vendors, number one. Uh, to me, Rasquache, the uh, Rasquache approach is a result of thought, of thought perfected to its most empirical, that is, as attitude or stance. So it's a, a fundamentally an attitude, an attitude uh, conditioned by consideration or, or speculation based on observation of lived experience. This attitude remains consistent within changed contexts. Um, and I think that what uh, Morales does with his um, exploded vendors piece is he reverse engineers the material manifestation of that attitude. That is those carts that these vendors push around on streets and sidewalks. Uh, and that material manifestation of an attitude is an attitude of intelligence and fortitude in the face of life's challenges. Um, so I think that Rasquachismo involves material, the manipulation of material. It involves everyday practices, but I want to emphasize that ultimately it's about an attitude of intelligence manifested in material form. Right, and I think, and a lot of it has to do with um, this lived experience, which I think is really important. And, and um, you know, so many, especially Julio, which, you know, I hope others do watch our, our charla with him. Um, he had, you know, talked a lot about his own upbringing in Tijuana, um, his grandfather, and how important this this all was. But it it does kind of root to this idea of a lived experience, you know, this urban lived experience, and for many cases, um, which I think, you know, kind of circles around back to the materiality as we, as we talked about. You're right, this attitude. Um, it, and, um, and it points a lot to car culture often, especially here in, in Southern California, um, which is kind of this reason why these hubcaps kind of fit nicely into the idea of resquache. Um, so I know there's this great story that, that you had come across these hubcaps. So I wanna, I wanna know if you can, you can talk a little bit more about the impetus of these, these works. Uh 
Remind me of what great. <laughs> well, I think you had mentioned that you there there was a an auto body store um, that you had passed by, and you know I guess around downtown San Diego, and um, you found all these hubcaps and uh, right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. right. I used to spend time um, in that part of San Diego. This was this would have been back in the mid '80s, and San Diego had a very dynamic. Uh, commercial gallery space. Uh, Mark Quint was located in downtown San Diego at one time, Patty Ann, um, Gary Garrardi and uh, Dan Wasel were also involved with uh, with places down there. So that would bring me down to Brown, downtown. Uh, I would work, um, sometimes I, I would take um, photographs to uh, Giant Photo, which existed downtown, Sushi, uh, existed downtown. Uh, let me give a shout out to uh, Lynn Schutte, who was tremendously influential in uh, the San Diego art scene and very supportive of um, me and other Chicanas and Chicanos when it came not only to um, having uh, work in her gallery or commissioned as uh, public art, but also uh, recommending us for positions. So I was on the National Board of the National Association of Artists Organizations back then as a result of Lynn. So Lynn, if you're out there listening, thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, and one of the places um, down there um, was a place called h, h Auto Wrecking. And I happened to be walking by, I guess I went in there just to nose around, wander around and see what, see what uh, there was to do. And I noticed uh, right at the entryway, there was a wall with all these old hubcaps. So this was in 85, this is a hubcap from the 50s. Um, the um, uh, hubcap Milagro number six that we're looking at. And I was just knocked out by how beautiful they were, how well designed they were, how uh, wonderful they were. And, and at the time um, that I was down there looking around, uh, a number of Chicanos had been invited by uh, David Zaff, who was a director at the Maple Creek Gallery. And he, um, he had invited us to produce work for the, for the ex, ex, uh, exhibition or to show work that we already had. And I wanted to create some new work. And so I liked the idea of the hubcaps as a framing device. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often stated that you know it, it refers to uh, Chicano lowrider culture. Um, I love lowriders, the people, and some of the cars are, are amazing, but I hate cars in general. Because... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but um, that uh, that bit of uh, serendipity, walking in there, and the invitation to be part of an exhibit led to. Um, the, the 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 initial production of the uh, of the hubcaps. This one uh, was, I think, inspired to a certain extent by um, something that um, Victor Ochoa told me. Victor Ochoa had talked to me about being at a lowrider car show when he had a vision and. It was a tattoo on a cholo's arm that Victor initially thought was a vagina. Uh, and then as they got closer, he realized, no, it was uh, a tattoo of uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. And this idea of the, the sacred and the so-called profane, I don't, I don't think the human body is profane. That's kind of an Augustinian St. Augustine idea of, of the body as something um, subject to decay, uh, defilement, and disease. Um, I was raised a Catholic. We don't talk too much as Catholics, uh, or not back then. I'm no longer a practicing Catholic. But uh, they never refer to the body as um, a source of pleasure, mm -hmm. especially um, when um, reaching the age of puberty. So this some might consider this a um, a Valentine to my own psychosexual um, anxieties. I like to consider it more 
um, a matter when you when we think about the Madonna horror binary. I, I think about it in terms of a duality rather than a binary. And for me, a duality is the simultaneous presence of supposed or perceived opposites in dynamic balance, in dynamic balance. And that dynamic balance uh, is not static. It's constantly transformational. It's constantly uh, changing. It's impermanent. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of working with objects that are, that have that dual nature was very appealing to me. The materials themselves, uh, sheet lead, which covers the uh, carved wooden heart is uh, once you begin working with it, it's very supple if, if it's a, a thin enough gauge uh, and almost flesh-like. I think the, the saw blades are, are perceived as uh, an aura mm -hmm. as it was in the um, Aslan exhibition that LACMA had back in the day. That It was a page in the catalog where the, um, the hubcap and the uh, that image that you're showing right now were um, were both visible. Right. Uh, let me. Hold on just a minute. Here's the way they uh, did it in the catalog. I don't know. If right. You know that. So the, the image is on one side of the catalog, it's a huge catalog. And then all by itself on a austere white page is the- um, The hubcap. Is the hubcap. But I think um, somebody there, the designer of the catalog uh, saw, saw that um, the relationship with the aura. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a interesting. And I know, and I think we talk about the title of Milagro, right? Which at once means miracle, but then certainly in, uh, as part of Catholicism, they are little, um, almost tchotchkes, right? Little hearts, uh, little limbs, or you know, whatever you use uh, in devotionals and prayers. Um, and then so in that way, it does obviously link quite well with um, religious iconography. Um, I know you, you've continued to work on these hubcaps throughout the eighties. And there are a couple examples, you know, that you continue to work in um, here and there. But um, we have two examples of other hubcaps that you've done from, from the 80s. And I think this is another interesting example of, again, bridging ideas of Catholicism, religion, um, and certainly kind of imprinted in this tableau-esque form on top of this hubcap. Um, and so this is, this is hubcap milagro number one. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you want to talk a little bit more about this one. Yeah. Um, this was something that I've never really had a studio. So I was working in my dad's garage mm -hmm. when I was uh, working on this piece. And my dad um, came up during the Depression. And if anybody out there has grandparents or great grandparents that lived through the Depression, they know they save everything. Mm -hmm. They never throw away anything. And my dad had this stack of uh, old uh, circular saw blades that were no longer useful because the teeth were no longer that sharp. And he had, you know, dozens of them. Uh, so as I was working on the carving of the heart, I set it down on a table that happened to have one of those saw blades. And I said, wow, that's kind of nice. It's kind of like a, an aura. Uh, raise um, behind the heart. So, and I think that's like an example of Rasquachismo is uh, uh, finding materials, repurposing them, using them in another way, and also finding, using whatever is at hand. And in this case, literally what was at hand. So right. I just reached out and grabbed it. The piece is a mild um, critique of, um, Christianity, this idea that if uh, Christ were to appear today, uh, the first thing that people would do would um, put him in jail, would be to put him in jail, that he would be unrecognizable and uh, certainly <laughs> undesirable. Uh, so it's a mild critique of, um, 
of uh, Catholicism and Christianity. And so th that, that theme that we saw in the previous subcap, that theme of the sacred heart of uh, Jesus uh, is something that was impressed upon me as an altar boy <laughs> right. back, back in the 50s and um, continues continues to be part of a, an iconography that I, I draw upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then this particular hubcap, you were inspired by an ad, is that right? This this kind of ad that you found um, and of, of um, this, well, I think it's like a rat pack that you were interested in and you had juxtaposed that with this particular hubcap. And I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about um, how you came across this image of, of imprisoned Christ in that way. Well, I, uh, as I was casting about for ideas, for inspiration, I uh, happened to come across in the Reader, San Diego Reader, an ad for the Stray Cats, which were this retro rockabilly group. Mm, okay. Uh, so the ad showed the members, Brian Seltzer and the other members of the Stray Cats, or what were they? I think yeah. so. I'm trying yeah. to remember. Yeah. Um, it showed them, you know, with their their duck ass uh, hairdos, what my brother Victor calls shams, uh, slick back, and uh, their t shirts rolled up and uh, all tattooed, and they were stealing hubcaps off of a car. And one of the figures was holding one of the hubcaps, and he had a tattoo of a heart on his shoulder. And I, I kept seeing the, the heart sliding onto the tattoo. Mm -hmm. um, and that image, that ad and the reader uh, very much influenced uh, this first piece. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of uh, my dad's uh, thriftiness, shall we say, his uh, depression era sense of uh, never throw anything away because you might need it again. Mm -hmm. combination of that um, and the stray cats. Yeah, yeah, and I think here's a nice detail to show um, this blade is kind of reusing, again, as you say, of these materials that are, are no longer uh, being able to be used for the, uh, for its purpose, for its original purpose here, at, you know, it's all because it's, it's, um, it's too, it's not sharp enough or, you know, whatever. And so I think um, it kind of speaks to this ingenuity as, as we've kind of talked about of, of repurposing these objects in order to create something completely new. Um, and, you know, that, that is kind of uh, in line again, as we say, of resquache, of, of reusing, repurposing um, in that way. Yeah. Um, and so I know that you, we have another hubcap, which again is done from the 80s and again um, uses the same type of saws, but this has a little bit of a different uh, feel, right? Because this um, is, a, is a little bit, you know, darker in this way. And I think it does connect to the um, imprisoned Jesus in, in many ways, right? Um, Jesus would maybe by some people be seen as an immigrant and um, there could be ideas of, of border protection uh, and things like that. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about this one and, and its relationship to the border and how um, you know the border is such a, a big part of, of Chicano, um, Chicano Chicanx cultural history and continues to be part of it as a site of pain. Um, and, and so I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about this one. Sure. Um, this refers to an act of border violence that occurred back in 1985. Um, there was an incident involving a border patrol agent called Ned Cole and uh, a young Mexican boy, 12 year old Humberto Carrillo. And um, Humberto, the, the story as reported in the press, was that um, Agent Cole felt that two other Border Patrol agents who were trying to arrest a young child um, were being beset, beset upon by folks on the other side of the fence. The fence uh, was in 
located between San Isidro and the uh, Tijuana neighborhood of Colonia Libertad. Uh, so he uh, claiming that he sensed that um, the agent's lives were in danger, he fired into Tijuana and shot Humberto Carrillo in the back. He didn't kill him, but he wounded him gravely. Um, and what's, what it really speaks to the, uh, to the legal loopholes that make that kind of brutality possible. And um, what, um, what happened was both the US attorney, the federal attorney and uh, San Diego County's district attorney stated that um, the federal, uh, the US attorney said since the person that was wounded was in Tijuana, uh, it wasn't his jurisdiction. And the mm -hmm. district attorney said that there was no way of uh, disbelieving Agent Cole's claim that he felt that the uh, other agent's lives were in danger. A civil suit was filed and um, ultimately a, another, a federal court did hear the case, not as a criminal case, but as a civil case and awarded um, Humberto Carrillo and his family um, close to uh, $600,000. Mm -hmm. um, these, these kind of uh, incidents uh, involving deaths uh, continue. Um, the uh, piece itself, if we look at the detail of it, um, it's common in Mexican editorial cartoons to represent Mexican people as a maguey plant, a century plant, or uh, as a nopal. So here I have the um, the Nopal representing Humberto Carrillo and um, the 357 Magnum uh, representing the federal immigration policy. And beyond Humberto Carrillo, the uh, Nopal represents, I think, all uh, immigrants and those seeking um, refuge at the border, people mm -hmm. coming for a variety of uh, purposes to better their lives to um, enable their children to have a better life as well. Um, so if you look closely, you see that one of the spines of the, of the Nopal has grown through the cylinder of the 357 Magnum. So it's kind of a um, hopeful piece, um, imagining the possibility that eventually the people in this country, those of Mexican ancestry, those of Central American ancestry, will put an end to the um, brutal immigration policies of the federal government. Mm -hmm. I think we see some of that in the um, recent election with the uh, increased voting within Latinx communities. Um, I don't know how that'll play out as the new uh, new cycles of uh, federal legislation uh, or negotiation, mm -hmm. uh, try to find some uh, remedies for the immigration solution. Right, I mean- Or the immigration uh, problem. Right, yeah. So I think what's what's kind of nice about these hubcaps is that they seem at once they function as, as these uh, kind of religious objects in, in one case, um, but then here, as we see in in this hubcap, as um, you know, this kind of reminder of of this uh, important event, the story, but it's not certainly something that um, we continually engage with, or, or is still part of our conversation, um, which you know, again, done in the '80s, but still very, very pertinent today, um, and and has this kind of um, resonance that is something that we continually we can continue to look back on um, and engage with. Um, so I think now well, I'm gonna- One quick comment. I think- Oh, sure. I think playing off of the, the title of these pieces involving a Hubcap Milagro, rather than being hopeful, maybe that, that particular Hubcap is a uh, sculpture looking for a miracle. Mm. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it's it's uh, 
that's an incredibly poignant thing to kind of end our conversation on right now. Um, but you're right, I think we're, we're constantly looking for a miracle in terms of of these communities and our communities and how um, you know violence continues to be shed on on brown and black bodies throughout the United States. Um, so I think I'll stop sharing my screen now. And I think we have a couple of questions. Um, so David, if you want, I can start pulling them up. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, questions. Um, anonymous attendee says that relates to themes of art rebeat as well. Um, okay, Thomas Ibarra Frasso sort of squatchy tends to describe an aesthetic and David is good to clarify it as role as an attitude and sensitivity towards resourcefulness. Indeed it is, and I think, um, you know, David, we can, you can respond to this as well. It certainly is an attitude that is something, um, you know, we've described it. it. It does speak to this idea of a lived experience and attitude Certainly, um, and, and it often, as you know, I've, I've stated in a couple of different charlas, but um, something that we're, we're working through is that it underscores this idea of resourcefulness and attitude, but then also uh, speaks to boosting up certain important figures in, in um, the Chicano uh, X communities, um, the Cholo, the, um, low writer culture and things like that. It is, it is this attitude that is, has been cultivated by, by these cultures through um, this idea of resourcefulness and um, creativity. Do you have anything else to add, David? Well, I think um, the Rasquache attitude has made its way into the um, museum and, and gallery world. Uh, and I, th I think, um, Morales's piece that I talked about earlier is a terrific example of someone who isn't trying to, um, who's actually paying homage to the intelligence. To me, that's a key word when we talk about Rasquache. Uh, so Tomas Ibarra Frausto wrote about uh, Rasquachismo, Amalia Mesa Baines in the section on Domesticana uh -huh. uh, in your exhibition uh, wrote about it. But there was also an essay by Ramon Garcia, uh, who talks about Rasquache as um, it, as a field of struggle mm -hmm. in Chicano aesthetics. Uh, it involves a more conscious and critical representation of working class culture, uh, involving involved Chicano cultures themselves in an internal dialogue concerning artistic representation. So he goes on to. Um, talk about it's a way of negotiating cultural resistance and opposition uh, through a rejection of assimilation. Uh, one can, however, speak of Rasquache as forces that are constructing new identities that have begun to be recognized with the end of the essential Chicano subject. And he points out the work of Yolanda Lopez and her portrait of the artist as the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is a concurrent exhibition, virtual exhibition there at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And he says that her self-portrait implies a feminist self-awareness um, and subverts sacred and oppressive codes of Marianismo, mm -hmm. transformation of familiar religious iconography into feminist self-portraiture questions and criticizes the religious codes that oppress the collective subjectivities of Chicanas. So that's another element I think that uh, I like to emphasize intelligence and an oppositional consciousness. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's certainly, um, Amalia Mesa Baines really cemented this idea of domesticana as this direct opposition um, and feminism regarding uh, uh, the rasquache, right? Which I think she you know, really correctly points out that the Chicano movement really, um, didn't pay attention to women, the familial world, the domestic sphere. And um, Amalia kind of rightly states that that women were, have been and continue to, to be unfairly um, pigeon held into ideas of Catholicism, right? Setting up the dichotomy between 
the Virgin and um, her counterpart, right? And so um, this is something that, you know, I, I encourage everyone should, should they want to have additional reading to certainly read um, Ibarra Fraso's original seminal text on, on Rescuache, Snows on Rescuache, but then certainly Amalia Mesa Veins and, and how that um, changes in terms of, of femininity, feminism, um, and, and things like that. Is there a catalog for the show? Unfortunately, there is not a catalog for the show, but I would encourage you to go visit the exhibition at ncasd.digital. Um, I uh, there's a couple of writings there, um, and yeah, I hope I hope you you check that out. Um, I'd like to just make a, a quick statement that the um, hubcap that we saw the uh, the one in which I uh, about which I spoke or referred to uh, the situation with Humberto Carrillo uh, is currently being installed at the San Isidro the Front Gallery. Mm -hmm. Uh, called Magnetic Currents, and I'd like to give a shout out to Francisco Morales, uh, Teresa Avila, and Armando de la Torre, who um, are responsible for the exhibition. And there's uh, nine hubcaps in that exhibition. It's it's a group show. There's other work as well. Uh, and all, while I'm giving uh, plugs for the other exhibitions, the bus poster is on exhibit uh, at the Smithsonian. American Art Museum, uh, the exhibition Printing the Revolution, The Rise and Impact of Chicano Graphics, 1965 to Now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess it's another virtual exhibition. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a in real life exhibition, there should be a catalog, um, you know, a shout out to my colleagues, E. Carmen Ramos and Claudia Zapata who organized that wonderful show. Um, I'm thrilled that uh, printmaking and, uh, have has is now you know really delved into it's a big part of um chicanx art history and, and you know it's it's very important in that way so uh, a thrilling show i think we all really look forward to reading the catalog and seeing that um i think we have time for one more question and so, oh two questions um so i will read margaret G, how many hubcaps have you created, David? And are you still making hubcaps? Well, I made one in 2020, which was quite an accomplishment. <laughs> Indeed. And making anything uh, this year has been complicated, I think. Um, well, I actually finished it in time mm -hmm. to uh, ship it to Cal State University uh, Channel Islands, where the first exhibition of magnetic currents took place. Uh, and it arrived just in time to, for the gallery to be shut down as was the whole state in March. But they're gonna, they're, they're putting out a catalog. So um, if people wanna reach me through you, they can, um, and then they're, they're interested in the catalog that the Magnetic Currents folks put out. Um, I don't know how many I've made because I stopped numbering them at some point. And, um, you know, probably no more than 15 or 20, yeah. Um, and we can do what, I think we have two more questions. Um, hello, David, would you comment on the tension between the complexity or the completely unselfconscious Rascuache expressions in vernacular art on walls and the streets of the barrios and this highly self-conscious artistic expression of Chicano artists? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a long question. So- um, could, you, could you repeat the question, please? I'm sure, sorry. no, oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, it says, would you comment on the tension between the completely unselfconscious Rescuache expressions in vernacular art on walls and the streets of the barrios and the highly self-conscious artistic expression of Chicano artists? Well, first of all, I don't agree that it's uh, completely unselfconscious. The work that is done on the streets is involves human intelligence. And that's the point I'm trying to make about Rasquache. There's not some, uh, you know, some conscious uh, bursting forth of whatever. Um, they both involve intelligence. I think on the one hand, you have a situation where um, I could state maybe in a crude way that the street doesn't need the museums. Mm -hmm. The museums need the street. 
when I look at Chicano Park and, and, and talking about the case of uh, border violence, uh, the most recent mural dedicated in Chicano Park was painted by Victor Ochoa and a group of people uh, working with him, young people that he was training uh, to commemorate and memorialize the uh, murder of Anastasio Rojas by uh, federal agents at the port of entry in San Isidro. Um, Victor is one of the original artists in 1973 through the efforts of Josie Talamantes um, and others uh, and the Chicano Park Steering Committee uh, uh, led by uh, Tommy Camarillo. Uh, both the park and its monumental murals are national historic landmarks. Um, the uh, Chicano Park Steering Committee, the muralists didn't need uh, a museum to do that. I, I think it's wonderful that Victor has some of his works in the exhibition. And when people scroll through the um, exhibition and the virtual, um, you know, yeah, scroll through the, the various pieces, they'll find a number of Victor's works mm -hmm. uh, related to his involvement with the Border Art Workshop. But I, you know, to talk about self-consciousness, that's, <laughs> artists are supposed to be self-aware. They're supposed to, they're supposed to be this relationship between the unedited and the edited. Mm -hmm. um, the, the willingness to just say and do whatever you're compelled to do, and then think about whether or not you want to refine it, whether or not you want to share it. I don't, I don't see it so much as a dichotomy. Um, I see, I see the, um, museums, especially like um, the Museum of Contemporary Art here in San Diego, as having been supportive of Chicano art uh, and border art and what the work of people, of artists in the border region who don't call themselves border artists necessarily, right. doing it for a long time. Back in the uh, 80s, um, there uh, was when the museum had a downtown space on market, I think it was, um, they sponsored a, a a group exhibition by the Border Art Workshop, Taller de Arte Fronterizo, um, called 911, A House Gone Wrong, that was all about the border. Mm -hmm. So there's there's been support. Uh, I think that your presence, uh, one of the great things about this, this charla was talking with you, Alana, and finding out your background as a, a researcher in Mexican modernism. We talked about the show that you had been involved with at MoMA, talking about the Mexican influence um, <laughs> on U.S. American art. You know, um, I, I don't. I'm not going to be put in a position of denigrating one over the other. I right. think both have roles to play. Um, I think that the MCA has uh, um, done a lot to play a positive role. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think the streets continue to live and breathe. Yeah, I think it's all part of a, an art ecosystem. We talk about this idea of the ecosystems so much. Um, and so I agree there isn't this kind of dichotomy or I wouldn't uh, make such a strict rule there. Um, we're all you know, contributing to this, this growing art ecosystem here in San Diego, but also elsewhere. Um, and so I would, I would say that. Um, uh, the last question, I think, before we wrap up in, in the next couple of minutes um, is Celia Herrera Rodriguez asks, I'm interested in the indigenous theoretical and philosophical underpinning of the work. Another and another and another dimension of Rescuache. Um, so, I, I mean, it's a complicated question and I think uh, a, a large one, but I wonder if you can give us a little okay. bit. I'll try and give it give an answer in 25 words or less. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Celia, for um, watching this webinar and for asking a question. Celia worked with a team of women under her direction in Chicano Park, painting a mural called Women Hold Up Half the Sky back in 1975 and uh, repainting it in 2012. Um, when I first visited the Centro Cultural back in the mid 70s, uh, as I was leaving, I saw painted above the big bay doors that they had at the time, 
the phrase in la kesh. Uh, tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other self. Mm -hmm. And I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten it. Uh, I didn't, you know, I was a Johnny come lately to the Chicano movement. Uh, and <laughs> my first taste of uh, Chicano art at the Centro involved that moral precept in la kesh. Tu eres mi otro yo. Not do unto you as I would have you do unto me, which is a kind of accounting system, uh, an accounting system. It's, uh, hey, you are me. Mm -hmm. So um, that sensibility um, impacts all my work, Celia. Um, beyond that, I, I think that I realize that what the Chicano movement was trying to do at the very beginning, when it insisted, even though in the Plan Espiritual de Aslan we called ourselves mestizos, it insisted that we recognize our indigenous ancestry. And that's another thing that's very important to me. Um, and, and that's why it's, it's wonderful to see people giving uh, credit to the people that have managed the land, managed the environment, uh, lived in an in La Kesh way with the environment, um, in the, with the, the Kumayai uh, and others. Um, so there's there's that aspect that that uh, that is important to me. This idea that hey, when things, when you live in a society that completely dismisses, disrespects, and denigrates you, you're going to find a way to imagine another way. Right. And I think what uh, Chicanas and Chicanos have done is to look to our indigenous ancestry, to look at the various nations, uh, tribes, villages, and gather and collect. So yes, it's influenced. I'm not sure if the three that we looked at um, have been influenced. Uh, there are other pieces that I've done that are that are more influenced by that indigenous ancestry. I hope that answers your question. Um, I think I think that's right, and I think uh, even when when we think about uh, Catholicism and, and its root, or uh, the Virgin de Guadalupe, like it, it speaks to this kind of I did indigenous vernacular. Certainly, before um, we think of like the Pachamama, which then leads later on to the Virgin of Guadalupe. So it's all sort of connected, in, and I think in that way. Um, but thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today, especially to David, thank you so much for your time and um, speaking so much about your work and um, this, this really important conversation, so. Just a quick thank you to uh, Lewis. Thank you for watching. Good to know you're here. Yes, hi Lewis. Well, thank you all. Um, and please do continue to follow us on, on Instagram, on Facebook to see what the museum is doing. Um, one last kind of tidbit, we have a program on uh, December 12th. It's a reading of Gloria Anseldua's text from with uh, 18 different voices. So I hope all of you will join us then um, to hear uh, Gloria Anseldua's work read aloud, um, it's kind of, marathon reading, but please do join us, jump in and out. Um, again, thank you, David, for your time and bye everyone. In answer thank to you. one of the questions, there will be a recording, right? Yes, there will be a recording. Yes, we will have this. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye, thank you, Alana. Thank you, thank, thank you. So